Right, welcome back. Let's continue our discussion on Pannalal Jankidas versus Mohanlal. Remoteness of damages is what this case dealt with. Our first contract law case by the Supreme Court, first landmark contract law case, decided on the 21st of December 1950. Uh, we have looked at some background to the case and some basic facts of the case. And uh, in this video, we will look at the arguments uh, presented by both sides and the judgment of the court. I have deliberately split this into two videos because of my aversion to making uh, longer videos. I am still shuddering at uh, the state of Tripura video which was half an hour long. I don't want to subject you to that much talk and uh, perhaps in the future some advertisements might start cropping up if you know if you continue to like these videos as much as you seem to be doing. Right, let's just get on with it. Uh, remembering that uh, Pannalal had purchased 92 bales of cotton and stored them, 92 bales of yarn and stored them and uh, on Mohanlal's behalf. So Pannalal had paid from his pocket. The goods were destroyed in that tragic Bombay explosion of April 14th, 1944. And the government had passed an ordinance as per which 50% of the value of uninsured goods would be paid for by the government. So the government had paid for half the value of those stored 92 bales of yarn and Pannalal wanted the remaining 50% to be compensated by Mohanlal. The uh, dispute therefore basically according to the agent Pannalal arose out of the ordinance and not out of anything else. If such an ordinance had not been passed, then the story would have been very different. The ordinance said that 100% compensation uh, would be paid to uh, insured goods and 50% for uninsured goods. That was the basic fact that arose out of the 13th July 1944 ordinance, the Bombay Explosion Compensation Ordinance of 1944. The uh, the agent in this case, Pannalal Jankidas, sued Mohanlal for the remaining 50% after Mohanlal refused to pay for them. So Pannalal went to court and the trial court actually found in his favor. Mohanlal was asked to pay the remaining 50% uh, value to his agent Pannalal. So Mohanlal, the principal, appealed that in the Bombay High Court and the Bombay High Court actually found that the trial court had neglected a certain piece of documentary evidence. This documentary evidence was the accounts uh, the uh, accounts kept by the agent in which he had entered that he had received four annas per bale per month as uh, a price for an insurance premium. So basically it was being proved that Mohanlal had indeed given four annas per bale per month to his agent Pannalal for insuring the goods against fire. Uh, annas for our younger audience is uh, a defunct measure of our currency. Uh, 16 annas make one rupee. Uh, that was the calculation. So four annas per bale for 92 bales comes to 23 rupees uh, per month. So these 23 rupees were entered in Pannalal's account books, which the trial court neglected, which the high court did take into account. And therefore the high court overturned the trial court's verdict, saying that since Mohanlal had been paying for insurance, Mohanlal would not be required to now pay for the remaining 50% value of the goods to Pannalal. The um, agent Pannalal then took this to the Supreme Court in appeal. And that is where we come in. So Pannalal, the agent, we'll just call him the agent henceforth, uh, made the argument that the principal should pay the remaining 50% value. 50% uh, had already been received from the government as per the ordinance. The remaining 50% should be paid for by the principal. The principal Mohanlal claimed that since the uh, agent had been receiving money in lieu of insurance premium, Mohanlal was not liable. It was Pannalal who should have insured and therefore Mohanlal was not required to pay Pannalal anything. So that was the argument of the principal. So the agent and principal basically had uh, reasonably valid arguments. The only problem was that it was admitted, it was proved 
that the goods should have been insured as per the instruction and indeed as per the payment made by the principal and the agent had neglected to do so. Now, if you were the agent's lawyer, you would have been flummoxed by this. But the agent's lawyer had found a very interesting argument. That was that the normal terms of a fire insurance policy in those days did not cover loss or damage occasioned by an explosion. This was specifically written in all the fire insurance policies prevalent at that time that the fire that was being insured against would only be fire that was caused by the illumination system inside the godown. Remember, this is the 1940s. Electricity was not as prevalent as it is today and therefore oil lamps etc might have been used, kerosene lamps perhaps and uh, fire insurance policies uh, were initiated based on the assumption that such illumination systems might cause a fire. Explosions were specifically excluded from the terms of typical fire insurance policies. A very valid argument one might immediately say and kudos to the agent's advocate for coming up with this. So the basic um, argument being made was that the damages did not flow directly from the negligence of the agent but remotely because of the passage of that particular ordinance. Further, the agent also argued using this treatise, Main on Damages, one of those fantastic, fabulous books that are the pillars of the common law system. The book states, and let me read it out, if an agent is ordered to procure a policy of insurance for his principal and neglects to do it, and yet the policy if procured would not have entitled the principal in the events which have happened to recover the loss or damage, the agent may avail himself of that as a complete defense. You might say that this precisely describes the situation over here, that the goods, even if they had been insured against fire, such a fire insurance policy would not have uh, resulted in a payment of the value of the goods, in which case the agent, despite neglecting to uh, procure such an insurance policy would not be held liable. The problem for the agent, of course, was that the ordinance did not consider any of these things. The other argument basically that the agent was making was something to do with the title of our video, remoteness of damages. And the immortal words of Baron Alderson from Hadley versus Baxendale are therefore relevant over here. Where two parties have made a contract which one of them has broken, the damages which the other party ought to have ought to receive in respect of such breach of contract should be such as may fairly and reasonably be considered either arising naturally from such breach of contract itself or such as may reasonably be supposed to have been in the contemplation of both parties at the time they made the contract. So what Baron Alderson has stated over here, in short, in a nutshell, uh, these immortal words, it's just almost criminal to, um, to summarize them, but let's have a go at it. What Baron Alderson was saying was that when the contract was made, what was the uh, possible outcome that both parties had contemplated? What was the limit of their imagination, basically? And if a breach had occurred because of something outside their contemplation, then would the party that had breached it be held liable? Surely, what the agent was saying, surely the agent and principal had not contemplated such a massive explosion which resulted in such massive loss of life and property, so massive that in order to um, indemnify and save insurance companies from going bankrupt, the government itself had promised and had started paying out compensation for the destroyed goods. Such an act, such an event was surely not contemplated by the agent and the principal when they had entered into the contract. A very fair and valid argument it might seem and that is why I keep repeating that this is an ideal case for uh, a moot court competition. Moot court of course is a uh, as a mock court for those of us who have not gone through law school, uh, moot courts are mock courts um, where students are required to argue both sides of a particular case. 
usually fictitious case but uh, i'm sure we can submit this to some competition and get some very um, creative arguments by law students so that was the agent's argument that it was the ordinance which had caused the problem not the neglect uh, to insure because even if they had been insured a typical fire insurance policy would not have covered the um, explosion anyway the principal had an equally valid argument first of all the principal referred to a very famous british case not as famous as hadley v baxendale but still nonetheless quite relevant over here tickle versus short where the judge had uh, stated that if an order is sent by a principal to a factor to make an insurance and he charges his principal as if it was made as if it was insured if he never in fact has made that insurance he is considered as the insurer himself what the principal is saying is that as far as he was concerned he had been paying the insurance premium was that premium being paid to an insurance company or to an agent who was supposed to pass it on to an insurance company is immaterial as far as the principal is concerned as far as the principal is concerned the goods were insured so since there is no insurance company in the picture at all the agent should be considered as the insurance company as the insurer this was held in a very relevant british judgment which was applicable of course and continues to be applicable to all common law jurisdictions uh, a very crucial argument you might say further and this really negates the remoteness thing that the agent had argued further the ordinance itself in section 14 i'm not going to read it out i'll spare you that stated that the terms of insurance policy were not material it did not matter what were the terms of the insurance policy because obviously no insurance policy at that time would have contemplated such an explosion no insurance policy would have specific terms enumerated that in case of ex uh, of an explosion we will indemnify you or something of that sort absolutely not so the ordinance uh, in in what we might say abundant caution had ensured that people will not fail uh, people will not receive compensation people will uh, and will definitely receive compensation even if their insurance policies had not covered explosions this is specifically what the ordinance was stating this of course was a very good counter to the second part of um, Baron Alderson's uh, very famous statement in Hadley versus Baxendale, which is why I have divided that into two points. It is the second part that we are trying to uh, negate what the principle is trying to negate, according to the usual course of things, from such breach of contract itself, or such as may reasonably be supposed to have been in the contemplation of both parties at the time. So all of that contemplation by both parties, etc., is irrelevant now that it has been. admitted and proved once the breach of duty has been admitted or proved the fact that the ordinance did not exist and could not have been in the contemplation of the parties is irrelevant for deciding the question of liability the liability was incurred by reason of breach of duty and the appellants made themselves liable to pay the damages a very succinct argument by the principal that as far as they are concerned they had been paying for insurance what were the terms of that insurance policy even the ordinance itself is saying that it does not matter what the terms were the basic point was were the goods insured or not if they were insured the government would pay full compensation if the destroyed goods were not insured the government would pay half the compensation and the uh, neglect in insurance was not that of the principal it was that of the agent so the agent was trying to escape liability for his neglect by claiming that the uh, damages were remote they were not directly because of the agent's neglect but because of the ordinance obviously the principal was trying to say that it is not the case at all that remoteness does not enter the picture and it is not the principal's fault that the government was paying only 50% compensation for uninsured goods the government was basically trying to indemnify insurance companies 
it was not trying to uh, trying to allow non insured people to get away with their negligence and that is what clinched the case for the principal uh, the judgment was uh, the case was heard by a three judge bench one of our smaller uh, benches one of the smallest in these early years of the supreme court the chief justice himself wrote the judgment and it is very readable lots and lots of uh, of of cases have been have been discussed in that particular judgment written by chief justice kanya and justice sudhiranjan das um, approved that judgment while justice patanjali shastri dissented and it is very interesting to read his dissent as well as i said it is a very good case for a moot court because you can very easily argue um, from either side and in my opinion the problem for pannalal jankidas the agent was that the government was basically uh, doing a hands off kind of a thing if this judgment had basically proved that as far as mohanlal was concerned pannalal was the insurer then perhaps pannalal should have sued the government saying that he was the insurer of those goods and so the government should pay 100% compensation and not 50% that is what i would have done if i had been pannalal jankidas's legal advisor but it wasn't to be i was born too late and here's this is where we are pannalal jankidas had to absorb 50% of the price of the goods he had paid for 100% on behalf of mohanlal and then the government had given him 50% back so 50% loss was incurred by pannalal jankidas unfortunately for him there was no further recourse available to him the supreme court found in favor of the uh, respondent mohanlal that he did not have to pay the uh, 50% value of the goods to the agent pannalal so that concludes the first of our contract law cases decided by the supreme court the first of our important contract law cases i hope that it has not been too complicated and i hope more importantly that it has been as interesting as i have found it to be pannalal jankidas versus mohanlal 21st december 1950 we will look at our next um, supreme court contract law case in future videos which is colonel macpherson's case a very interesting one again another one which um, people like us are likely to encounter rather than the fundamental rights case which happen very rarely but these contract law cases are uh, stuff that all of us live through almost all the time so that concludes this particular video i hope you have enjoyed it i hope you keep uh keep listening to the supreme court historian youtube channel and i hope that you take care of yourself thanks a lot bye bye